Today we're going to talk about connection and how connection is something that changed my life greatly. We're also going to talk about how connection is something that we should remind ourselves of doing daily and making sure that we connect with those around us because in our fast-paced world we tend to forget that. We're also going to talk about, more importantly, the hows and how we connect. And the hows kind of follow my journey in a very difficult period in my life. Two people reached out to me and impacted me greatly. When I was 15 years old, I was kicked out of school. Not for anything crazy. I was kicked out because I didn't attend school. Back then, if you missed more than 15 days of classes, you were asked not to come back. So by the time it was October in my grade 10 year, I was expelled. And the reason I wasn't going to school is because I developed deep depression and anxiety for something that was happening for about a year and a half. I was being severely bullied verbally and socially. I just couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Nobody reached out to me, no teachers, uh, no guidance counselors reached out to me at that point. And I was just asked not to come back. And I felt completely alone. I was a 15-year-old dropout that didn't belong anywhere. Everything that I was connected to, I gave up on. My parents, my family, my friends, my dojo, my school, everything. And two people reached out to me and connected me and impacted me greatly. Both of them connected with me in two very different ways, using the same type of method, which was questions. One was through commonality, and one was through care. The first person that reached out to me was my sensei. That's my dojo. He reached out to me because he realized that I wasn't going to class anymore. So he called my mom and said, hey, I noticed Carrie's not going to class anymore. What's going on? Mom gave him the lowdown, and uh, he wanted a meeting with me. I was terrified. This is a man that I held in such high regard. I looked up to him. He was my mentor. I still remember writing, I still have the journal. I wrote down when I was 10 years old, I want to be a sensei like my sensei. And I remember going to that meeting, walking into his office and sitting across from him. And he looked at me and said, what's up? I didn't know how to respond. I think I stared at him blankly. I probably maybe even stuttered over my words. Then he asked one of the most single important questions that changed the course of my life. If I can give you anything in this world, what would it be? Here's my mentor, somebody I held in such high regard, asking me what I wanted. Nobody ever asked me, a 15 years old, what I wanted. And I quickly blurted out, a job. I want a job. Because remember, I thought I was a dropout. I thought I wasn't going to ever belong to anything else. I just wanted to fit in. And back then, nobody's hiring any 15-year-olds. He said, you got a job. So my first job was working at the dojo. My only job, actually, was working at the dojo. It's my, it started my 23 years there. And my first task was to clean toilets. That's all I did for a full year, was clean toilets, $5 an hour. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Why? Because I was in a place where people were like-minded. The positivity of the dojo, people were driven the same way. And I was making a difference. And if you don't think cleaning a toilet makes a difference, Go use a dirty bathroom. I was making a difference. What was created at the dojo, what my sensei was creating, was a place where you could be who you were. You could be vulnerable. And that floor is a space to where that happens. Brene Brown, one of my favorite authors in uh, TED Talks, if you guys ever listened to her, she's phenomenal, has a great quote. And it talks about shame. If we share our story with somebody who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. It can't. My shame that I carried of having to be this tough person, because I did karate most of my life, I played hockey most of my life, but I couldn't handle words, 
I felt shameful. I didn't want to tell anybody. I hid it. And because the space of that room, that dojo, I could be who I, who I was. What's the impact when we find commonality, common ground with those around us? Our coworkers, our employees, when we find a common goal to work towards, how motivated are they going to be to work for you? They're going to be there every day, showing up on time. Our family, when we find common interests with them, and we share ideas and thoughts. What type of relationships do we build with them? And our kids. I was reminded of this this morning, actually. My son, who's five years old, um, he tried out for our competition team, our martial arts competition team last night. And he said to me, I don't want to do it. I said, well, can you tell me why you don't want to do it? He said, because I'm shy and I'm nervous. At five years old, he's telling me this. And I said, you know what? Mommy gets nervous. I get shy sometimes. And we talked about it. And what that did was he saw me as human. I connected with him and let him know that I feel that way too. So our impact can be great when we find those common grounds, common goals, and drives. The next person that impacted me greatly was my guidance counselor. So nobody called from school to find out where I was. I was part of the IB program. I, was, uh, I didn't skip too much in grade nine, so I was a pretty good student, but it did happen. Um, and I guess my file landed on Mr. Oliveira's desk, and he reached out to me every morning. He called me for 10 days, 7 a.m. every morning. Carrie, get to school. Carrie, get to school. Carrie, get to school. It became a joke. I would hang up on him. I would say, I'm not going. I was, there's no way I was getting, going to school. And then one morning, instead of saying, Carrie, get to school, he asked me, do you like coffee? I said, uh, it's 7 a.m. Like, of course I like coffee. And he said, okay, well, I got this coffee machine. I don't know how it works. Can you just come make me a decent cup of coffee? Don't ask me why, but that question worked. I got on my uniform, made the 45-minute trek, because back then, Brampton Transit, you were, <laughs> you were better to walk. If you're from Brampton, you know. So I made the 45-minute trek to school, and I made him a cup of coffee. I sat there all day with my cup. He didn't ask me to go to class. He didn't ask me very much, many questions. He didn't judge me, anything like that. And he just said, at the end of the day, he said, look, like, I really can't make coffee. Can you just come every morning and make me some coffee? And I'm like... Yeah, I guess. I guess I'll come to class and I'll make you know, sit in your office and make you coffee. That was his way of getting me in the building. That was the start of me going back to school and eventually graduating even early. I remember Mr. Livrier vividly. He was a ball of energy that was so contagious. You could not help but catch his energy. He was an amazing man. With a smile and twinkle, I was greeted every morning that way, with a smile and a good morning. I loved going to his office. Why? Because he knew the value of showing up for his students, what it meant to be present. Our presence is made up of few things. One of our things that our presence is made up is body language. That's the way you sit. That's the way you stand eye contact. 55% of the way we communicate is done through our bodies and not through our words. So how do we show up when we're in meetings, when we're talking to people? Tone of vo voice, 38% is our tone. That's 93%, not even the words we're using. 
Are we using a harsh tone, a caring tone, I don't care tone? How are we showing up? I had the opportunity of reaching out and contacting Mr. Livrier uh, after tw almost 20 years. And although it was over the phone, I couldn't see his body language. His tone and his words made up for it. He was still that ball of energy that I could catch over the phone. The impact, when we really show up, when we really show up in conversation, through our presence, we are telling those that are with us that they matter. What they have to say matters. We've all been in conversations, we've all been in meetings where the people that are around us don't want to be there. They're looking at their phones, they're thinking of their to-do list, the thousand things that they have to do after this meeting. They're not present with us at all. What happens to our coworkers or our employees when we are like that? To our family members when we're having a conversation and we're texting? Or to our kids who are trying to tell us about their day and we're like, okay, mommy's just gotta put something on the stove. Okay, mommy's just gotta do this and mommy's just gotta, do hold on one second. And we don't let them say the little things to us. Now, what if we switched it and we were totally 100% present in that meeting? What kind of ideas and thoughts and motivation do our employees get? Our family. They know that we care. They know that we love them. We're there for them no matter what. And our kids, when we push the little things aside, they don't want to share big things. So when you invite the little things and you're like, I'm here for you, they know that they can share the big things with you. All the work that I do, so yes, I still, I still work at the karate school, but I also um, run Brave Education with my partner, Kevin. And all the work that I do, I'm trying to give back what those two men taught me. Because I don't believe in just taking. So I'm always trying to be present in any conversation that I'm, that I'm having. There are times, yes, I slip up. But I'm always trying to be mindful of that. And one day, I got this beautiful text. It was very late at night from one of my students. And it was a massive, it was like, I swear, it was like this long. And um, it was this awesome text just saying, from heresy, saying how proud he was of the work that I was doing with Brave and how proud he was of, of me. And I was a little dumbfounded because to me, heresy was just one of my karate students. I had no idea what he he knew about Brave or anything like that. So I reached out to Heresies and I said, look, I'd love to meet for coffee and discuss this. So him and I went for coffee and I asked him, I said, look, like it was a beautiful text. Like I'm just a little, I don't understand what this text is about. And he said, you don't remember, do you? I said, uh, no, I, I don't remember. He said, well, when I was in grade one, I was very shy, and I was severely bullied um, because I was very small for my age, but I was also the only Sikh in my school. So I kept to myself. And you came to my school, and you were teaching about brave, about how to stand up for yourself. So I was teaching the kids how to assert themselves through body language, how to be how to um, assert themselves through their tone. So I gave them a little bit of a drill, some role playing to do. And I said, okay, go work with your partner. And I was walking around the classroom. And I noticed that he was sitting at his desk by himself, not working with anybody. Apparently, he said, I walked up to him, got down to his level, and asked him a question. Are you being the most confident in you today? And I walked away. Five seconds. He said he straightened up, went over to one of the groups, and asked if he can join them. He said he went home that evening, 
told his mom about the day, told his mom about the workshop. And he said to his mom, because back then I used to wear my karate uniform when I taught. He said, I want to train with that lady. And that was his start of uh, training at the karate school. He said he wanted to thank me because he knows what Brave did for him and how it impacted him and changed his life. And he's trying to do the same thing, and I see it when he's teaching classes for me at the karate school. I see him trying to make those connections and change people. And we never know the impact that we're going to have on somebody. We never know where that's going to come from. Impact them anyways. Connect anyways. One of my friends told me, uh, we were talking about students, and I think this relates to any relationship in our lives. People come in your life for a reason, for a season, or for a lifetime. Connect with them anyways, even if it's for just a small season. Connection starts with a question. Those three stories all started with a question. To the thought-provoking, if I could give you anything in this world, what would it be? To the simple, do you like coffee? Or to the five seconds to a, to a young boy, are you being the most confident you today? So my question to you is what question will you ask to positively change and impact another person? Thank you.